had the great fortune of uh, getting my PhD at the University of Virginia under a, a, um, a brilliant scientist by the name of Erwin Konigsberg, and he was one of the first people to clone stem cells. So I actually was doing stem cell cultures in 1967, so that's 40 years ago. Well, people think oh, stem cells are this brand new thing. It's like, no, no, stem cells have been around for a long time, except a very exclusive um, um, club studying them. And the beautiful part about my stem cell research was as I started to do this and I was cloning genetically identical cells, I started to realize that if I would take these genetically identical cells and put them into separate petri dishes and then change the environment in those dishes, that in one dish they will form muscle, in another dish they'll form bone, and yet in a third dish they would form fat by changing the conditions. Uh, it, you stop for a second and realize, well, wait, they're, they were all genetically identical. So what is it that controlled why they became muscle or bone or fat? And the answer was very obvious. It was like information from the environment. So this started to lead me on a different trail than all my colleagues who were getting focused on the, on the genome and you know building up the background to create the genome project while I was doing this. So I was taking the road less traveled at that time. I was looking into the role of how the environment influences the expression of cells while everyone else was looking at how genes control cells. And yet uh, my papers were published in, in very prestigious journals and uh, the, the results were very clear. It wasn't even ambiguous. It was that the fate of the cells was uh, primarily determined by the environment that cells find themselves in. So when I published this, uh, I was, of course, very excited by this, but then found myself to be a very small crowd of one in my uh, community because uh, I had violated, violated, mind you, what is called the central dogma. The central dogma is the pillar of modern biomedicine today. It was a concept that was coined by Francis Crick, the guy, one of the co-discoverers with Jim Watson of the DNA Double Helix. And the central dogma simply says this, and you, you're very familiar with it, is that the flow of information in biology goes from DNA to RNA to protein. And this is established in all the textbooks. It's still in all the textbooks at this very moment. So it says information flows from DNA down. And uh, therefore, since your body, which is made out of protein, and the proteins are coded for by the DNA, then we have bought the belief, as the dogma says, that your fate and your lot in life is determined by the genes you receive at, uh, at conception. So we become uh, you know, victims of our heredity in this sense, if you understand it from this point, that you didn't pick your genes, and you can't change your genes, and since your genes control your life, then you're a victim to those particular genes. That is the message that conventional science has been teaching. And the issue is, that's, that's totally false. So uh, as you understand the terms quantum physics and quantum mechanics, or Newtonian physics and Newtonian mechanics, what you see is that physics and mechanics are synonyms. So physics really means the mechanisms by which the universe operates. And the new physics, quantum physics, was something that I really wasn't into, nor were any of my colleagues in the medical school. We were all trained in Newtonian physics. And the difference between the two is very profound. Newtonian physics says the world that we live in, the universe we live in, is a, is a machine made out of mechanical parts. If you want to understand how it works, take it apart, study the pieces, change the pieces, change the operation. That's the basis of medicine. We look at a human body, it's a machine made out of physical parts. When it's not working right, change the parts by buying chemicals and drugs. Uh, and that's the way that conventional medicine operates. When I started to read the quantum physics, I realized, oh my goodness, the, the whole foundation of the universe is not based on a mechanical, physical universe. It's based on the invisible energy called the field. So uh, let's say if I hold a magnet right here in front of you, and you can see the magnet, but what you can't see is the invisible magnetic field. And, and so what it says is, well, we are physical things in our world, like physical bodies. We're immersed in fields, electromagnetic uh, fields, magnetic fields itself, uh, all kinds of fields like telephone, uh, cell phone fields, uh, television fields, radio fields, whole ranges. What is the difference between the Newtonian physics and the quantum physics is this. Newtonian physics focus on the particles. 
quantum physics says, you want to understand why the particles take this shape? Then you have to understand the field. It's the field that controls biology. It's the invisible forces. There's a great quote by Albert Einstein, and it's, it's simple. It goes, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. In other words, in the world of invisible things, fields, and particles, matter, it's the field that gives shape to the matter. And this is the basis of quantum physics. This becomes relevant. It says, okay, here's the physical particles of my body. Why are they uh, in a healthy state, or why could they be in a sick state? That's the physical expression. And the answer is, well, to understand that, don't look at the body. You have to understand the invisible forces in the field. Uh, it, it, it's, it, and it's fun, because if you think about it, when, 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 of course, when, when you were young, at some point you must have had like iron filings and sprinkled it around a magnet, and all of a sudden you saw the iron filings form that pattern of the magnetic field. Well, quantum physics would look at this pattern and try to explain how come all the iron filings fell in this pattern without recognizing that the field exists. In other words, can you explain why the iron filings have this shape if you don't recognize the magnetic field? And the answer is absolutely not. What's the nature of it? the body and its cells are like iron filings. Medicine is trying to understand the nature of the body by looking at the iron filings. And quantum physics says, if you don't understand that invisible field, you can't ever understand what's happening in the body. And then you say, well, what does this field constitute? Well, it's the, what is called the matrix, which is an interesting word because uh, Max Planck, one of the founders of quantum physics, talked about this invisible shaping field and gave it the name the matrix. And that, of course, has been used in the movie and, and, uh, and in fact, uh, people have talked about this matrix. Some people refer to it as the divine matrix. Uh, my friend Greg Braden, who wrote a book about that, meaning not only is this the invisible field, the energy field, but it's equivalent to many people what is God and spirit. Okay? So invisible forces, whether you use the physics context and talk about invisible forces as fields, or you use the spiritual context that says the invisible forces are spirit, the spirit and the field at least represent the same thing in modern science. So science is bringing the spiritual concept of invisible forces into play into the physical world that was left out by Newtonian physics. Conventional allopathic medicine is completely locked into Newtonian physics. Doesn't even bring the mind into the concept of healing, which is interesting because they actually, in a medical education, medical students get about 15 minutes in their entire academic career of a thing called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is simply the mind can change the character of health. In other words, if you believe that this drug is the miracle drug you've been looking for and you take it, your mind believing it's, it's the miracle drug can heal you while the drug itself was nothing more than a sugar pill. And, and now that's an established fact. One third of all medical healings are due to the placebo effect. Okay? It becomes very important. Now comes, well, we left something out of the picture in the education. Not that it's out of the picture in the research, but in the education it says the placebo effect is when you have positive thoughts and it generates a healing response. What they don't talk about in the books and in the general mass media is something called the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect is the same as the, as the placebo effect, except the thoughts are of a negative nature. And what's the point? It's thoughts that are powerful, whether they're positive or negative. And while we give uh, attention to the positive thoughts, called placebo effect creating healing, what we know and what we don't talk about is that a negative thought, which constitutes what is called a nocebo effect, is as powerful as a placebo, but in the opposite direction. So a negative thought can not only make you sick, a negative thought can kill you in much the exact same power and using the same mechanism that a positive placebo thought can heal you. And this becomes important because psychologists tell us that 70% or more of our thoughts as conventional people are negative and redundant, meaning Every day, 70% of people's thoughts are actually taking health away from their lives and, and actually bringing less quality to their lives, and they don't count it because it's just that little thought that runs in their head, and yet, scientifically, it's the equivalent of the placebo effect, but backwards. So uh, this has to come into medicine, but there's an unfortunate part about medicine, and that is 
Medicine is not really the free avenue of research and investigation as we think it is. It is controlled by money, and unfortunately, this is where the pharmaceutical industry has undue influence and keeps us from looking at healing that does not involve chemicals and drugs. Only for the simple reasons this. A pharmaceutical company makes money by selling chemicals. If we talk about how you can heal yourself with your mind, then that product doesn't sell very well. And, and, and there's a parallel here, because let's look at the very obvious. We live in a world where there are many other forms of providing energy besides fossil fuel, many of them very efficient, much more effective. Where are they? And the answer is, it's not in the interest of the oil companies to support free energy heat, you know, uh, 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 sources of, of, of power. And it's the same thing with medicine. It's not in the interest of the pharmaceutical industry to support free energy healing. And therefore, it's a subject that gets no coverage except for that 15 minutes on the placebo and then dropped out of the system. And yet it is the most important new understanding. And it's not new because it's 100 years old or more. It's, it's new only because we're beginning to look at it in spite of the fact that drug companies don't want us to see it. The, the problem with the concept of power, uh, the power of positive thinking is people just think, oh, well, if I just have positive thoughts, then my life should be affected. And, and this is why positive thinking has a real bad rap in the public. And the reason is this. Having a positive thought does not in any way necessitate that those positive thoughts actually manifest themselves. And there's a piece that was left out. And if you don't understand the piece, then you're shouting into the wind with your positive thoughts. Nothing's going to happen. And the fact is this. When you're having positive thoughts, you're using your mind. The new biology reveals that the invisible forces that collectively we refer to as mind, that these form a field which shape biology. Well, here's what's important. Yes, the mind influences biology, but there are two parts to the mind that are completely different than one another, yet they work together, we confuse them, we tie them together, and yet they represent two entities working in two different fashions. There's the conscious mind and what is called the subconscious mind. Now, here's what the very important people have to know this, okay, and here's what it is. The conscious mind is our creative mind that is connected to our personal identity and our spiritual selves. That's, that makes us all unique. Our, our, each of us has our own personal conscious mind. But what becomes very significant is this, is the subconscious mind is equivalent to a tape player. It's exactly what it is. It records experiences and then plays them back. And, and so now let's take a look and say, well, wait, there's a thinking mind and then there's a tape player mind. And what's different about them is very profound. So let's talk about two fundamental differences first. The tape player, the subconscious mind, as an information processor, as the equivalent of a computer, is a million times more powerful an, an information processor than is the conscious mind. So when you look at the power between the conscious and subconscious, the subconscious is a million times more powerful. Number two, on a day-by-day -day basis, the subconscious mind runs our biology about 95 to 99 percent of the time. So while you're having all these wonderful thoughts, that's not the conscious, the conscious mind's not running the show. It's a subconscious mind. Then it comes the issue is, well, the subconscious mind got programs in it. Yes. And the, and the subconscious mind is not evil or good. The subconscious mind is a tape player. As much as you can say, uh, okay, here, here's a tape player. It's good or bad. So the tape player's not good or bad. The programs can be good, and the programs can be bad. So blaming the subconscious mind as a negative thing, is, that's the first mistake. It's a tape player. The programs that we got, that's the source of the problems that most of us face. And that these programs could limit our abilities and take away our powers, which essentially they do. Now, the relevance about positive thinking is this. Positive thinking is a creative thought that comes from the conscious mind. Okay, so I sit here and I'm going to have all these wonderful thoughts. I'm going to close my eyes and visualize all these wonderful things. Now stop and go back to, the, to the, the mechanical character of it. A, I'm having these thoughts with a little tiny processor called the conscious mind, and I'm competing with the programs that are in the subconscious mind. So if I have a thought for uh, being, being healthy or being in a good relationship, and I'm doing positive thinking, 
And at the same time, I have acquired programs in my development that said you're not as healthy as you think you are and you, you're not that good a person to have those kind of relationships. Then look, I'm now pitting my positive thoughts against my programs and, and, they're, and they're opposite. But this one works on a little, little tiny processor, and this processor is a million times more powerful. So right away, it's like, who's going to win in that challenge? The answer, of course, the subconscious is going to win. Okay? But here comes the other part. While I can try to maintain positive thoughts in my life using my conscious mind, this conscious mind only operates less than 5% of the day. That says 95% or more of the day, I'm operating from the other belief system. The point is, do the math. How powerful are positive thoughts? And the answer is, unless the subconscious has the same programs and agreement as the conscious mind, power of positive thinking will not work. It will not work because you're competing against a much more powerful processor. Okay? And this is the problem. And now here comes, let's add one more piece to the problem, then it really manifests the big problem that people in this world are facing today. And that is, the conscious mind and subconscious mind work together in tandem, meaning, my conscious mind, as small a processor as it is, can run any aspect of my biology. I can run anything. I could run my heartbeat right now for you. I can speed up and slow down my heartbeat. I can change my body temperature with my conscious mind. We used to think those were involuntary, that the body had a part of the brain that ran all the things, and your conscious mind only ran things like your muscles. That's not true. We now know that people who are very conscious can control every function in their body. But here's the problem. The conscious mind is a very small processor. The subconscious mind is a million times more powerful. You have to take care of your breathing, your heartbeat, your digestion, all your functions, your immune system, your respiration, your digestion, excretion. Your conscious mind can't focus on all that. So the nature of it is the function of the subconscious to carry out all the details and can carry out every one of the details. We could be essentially unconscious, which most people are, and our lives look exactly the same. Why? Because once you learn how to get dressed, you know how to get dressed. Once you know how to drive a car, you don't have to be conscious how to drive a car. You already got the program. So everything that we learn in our subconscious mind becomes automatic behavior, meaning it frees up the consciousness. So the consciousness doesn't have to be dealing with all the tasks. Well, when you free up the consciousness, then you have time for creative thinking. But here's the issue, and this is the catch. When the consciousness is not focusing on some job or some task, and let's say it's on a daydream mode, it's thinking about your vacation next week. You're going on vacation and you're thinking about the plans of your vacation in your conscious mind. Well, if your conscious mind is thinking about the vacation, who's running the day-to-day, moment-to-moment life? The answer is the subconscious. But now here's the catch. Does the conscious mind observe the behavior as it automatically plays from the subconscious mind? And I go back and say, well, where was your mind? It was thinking about the future. Well, if it's thinking about the future, then it wasn't paying attention, right? And the answer is, aha. The nature of the trade-off is the subconscious mind can run everything when the conscious mind is busy. If the conscious mind is busy, it's not paying attention. And so when it's not paying attention, it does not see the programs that are playing in the subconscious mind. So to give you like an amusing anecdote about it, is you know somebody and you know their parent and you realize that this person and their parent pretty much have the same behavior. And so you, in enthusiasm, you burst on the scene and you say, you know, Mary, you're just like your mom. As soon as you say that to Mary, back away from Mary. Why? Because she's not going to take this in welcoming news for her. She's going to say, like, how can you say that? To her, she's not like her mom at all. And, and the issue is interesting. It's like the joke is everybody, can, everybody else can see that Mary's like her mom. But Mary can't. Why not? And the answer is because when she's playing the programs which she got from her mother, which are in her subconscious, she's playing them because she's not paying attention. And so when they play, she doesn't see them. So she's surprised when people say that she behaves like her mom, even though that's what her life is all about. Now, the, the conclusion of why all this dialogue and why was it all important, the answer is this. That we do not see the subconscious when it plays. The subconscious has programs in it that we primarily get from other people in our development. And the significance about that is that if we are operating from this subconscious mind and not seeing it, then we're also not seeing that we're playing programs that may not be in any way supporting who we are and what we want. The programs, those are in the, in the conscious mind. So the idea is 
when life doesn't work, when you don't find that relationship that your positive thinking was looking for, when you don't uh, get that health that you were looking for because your positive thinking was asking for it, we have a tendency, therefore, to blame the outside world because, as far as I know, my intention was for all these wonderful things. And when I don't get it, it can't be me because I have all these wonderful positive intentions. What we didn't see was, while we were having those positive intentions, using our conscious mind for those positive intentions, the subconscious was running the show. And we didn't see that we generally sabotage and destroy or limit our own lives with behaviors that are not supporting us. And why this is important is because then we all generally cop the attitude that there are forces outside of me that control my life and I am a victim of this world and I can't do anything about it as a victim. And as soon as you buy that, you are a victim. And the only problem was, it was your own subconscious programming that, that led to the life that you have. And that if you can understand that and then try to work with it, then you can change your subconscious programming and change your life. Now come, comes, comes a problem. And the problem is, we also bought this, and it's not true, that there's somebody in the subconscious. Meaning, if my conscious finds my subconscious engaging in some behavior that's not supporting it, then my conscious is talking to myself, and my conscious is saying, Bruce, God, that was stupid. You could do better than that. And you're having this inner dialogue, and you're talking to yourself, and being very upset about the fact that your behavior seems to be out of control. Who are you talking to? And I love this because the reality is we're thinking we're talking to ourselves, and that's going to fix something. And what is it going to fix? Well, the program's in that subconscious. Uh, and the, here's where the problem lies. Subconscious is a tape player. There's nobody in there. You, the, the, the same exact truth holds in this case. Get a tape player, put a cassette tape in it, push play, the program's running, and you don't like the programming, so here's what I want you to do. Go up and talk to the tape player. Go up and talk to it. Suggest that it change the program. Even tell it what you want it to play. Do, do all this, and then you realize the program still plays, it doesn't change, and then you get more upset with yourself. Why? Because you've asked this program to change, it's not changing yet. Then you get mad at yourself, you start yelling at yourself, and now you're berating yourself because you can't control the tape. Then that doesn't work, and then of course the last step, you have to bring God in, because obviously you tried to change your life, and it didn't work, so only God has to come in here now and change the tape. And, and the joke is, how much talking to a tape player does it take before the tape changes? And the answer is, you can talk to your blue in the face, and it will not change. It's not that you can't change the tape, but you have to learn how to push the record button. And then you can record new programs in the subconscious. But our old belief system, like conventional psychology, let's go over and find out why my life is this way. Oh yeah, my mom did this to me, and my dad did this, and my friends did this, and now I make a whole list of all the reasons why my life is this way. I'm very clear, my conscious mind's got, oh God, I could play that movie, I, I can see it. And the question is, now that you're aware, did it change the tape player? And the answer is no. And that's why people get so upset. They, they go through all of the psychology counseling and stuff. They know all the reasons. They still have the same life. So the issue is, you want to make change? Then you have to learn how to engage the tape player in a record mode and not just talk to it. What's interesting about EFT uh, is, is that it is a process which really, in some sense, engages uh, like super learning. And super learning is the equivalent of pushing the record button on the subconscious mind. Meaning, we got our programming from the last half of fetal development through the first six years of our lives. And there's a reason why this is a special programming part of our lives. And the answer is, that our brain, when we look at the uh, EEG, the electrical activity of the brain, that a child doesn't express consciousness as we know it, alpha waves, as a predominant brain state until after six years of age. Before six years of age, their predominant brain states are theta. But theta, uh, which is a state of imagination, so when you go back and you realize that kids less than six live in mixing the real world and the imaginary world, that's an expression of their brain function. But it also is important to recognize that theta is equivalent to a hypnagogic trance. 
that if I want to hypnotize you, I have to get you out of consciousness and drop you into like this theta place. And when you're in theta, I bypass consciousness and the program goes into the subconscious mind. Now stop and say, but a child's brain is in this theta state essentially up to the first six years of its life. So the point is, our first six years, we're not actually engaging in consciousness, we're just downloading experiences. Well, these experiences, then we play them back as our life characters and our life behaviors. Yeah, but you downloaded them from other people so that you download your parents' behaviors and they become your behaviors. But then again, as I said, as you get older, you don't see this because they're subconscious and, and your conscious rarely observes this. So we start to play these behaviors that really represent other people's behaviors. And so when we're not being conscious of ourselves, the behaviors that we play are not necessarily supporting us in any way. They're, they're most likely sabotaging us. Why? Because we acquired them from other people. So what do we acquire in our development is that we're just average people. That we have no extraordinary powers. That e even healing isn't one of our powers because when we were in that zero to six year period, every time we got sick, we were told we had to go to the doctor to get healed. That's, that's an experiential program. So what does my subconscious mind learn from this experience? Every time I'm sick, I have to go to the doctor. Why? Apparently it's a step before you get healed. So we build that into the program and then, which is interesting is that we have an innate ability to heal ourselves. That's what the placebo effect is all about. But when we put in a program that says, I have to go to the doctor before I get healed, then what you do is actually stall your own ability to heal yourself until you go to the doctor. And the joke, many people get well on the way to the doctor without having any treatment. And the reason is, they already had the ability to get well, but the program step said, until you do this next step, then the healing doesn't start. So we deprogram our ability to heal ourselves. It's based on the individual. It's always been that way. But because we've been so programmed to devalue ourselves and de you know, disempower ourselves, that we look at ourselves as victims and frail uh, biological entities, you know, ripe for bacteria to eat us up and all these other things. It's like, this is totally untrue. So the issue is we have to start from that belief and change these beliefs of who we are. We are profoundly powerful people. Look, you can walk across hot coals, you know, a, a, a woman can lift a car off of an infant without thinking about it. Um, down south, the uh, Baptist fundamentalists of the Pentecostal faith work themselves up in a Jesus state and drink strychnine in toxic doses to demonstrate that God protects them. They're not harmed by the strychnine. I mean, you can walk across fire, you can drink poison, you can lift thousands of pounds. Where's the frail image come from? And that's a belief. But the problem is if you believe you are frail, if you believe you are susceptible, if you believe you have a terminal illness, they manifest because that's called the nocebo effect. I see people change their lives all the time. And then my conventional scientists go, oh, you know, that's like, oh, uh, that's, you know, frou-frou stuff. And it's like, no, it's real. These people have changed their lives. And, and then because there's no connection of how that can happen in their allopathic thinking, they're not left with an ability to think of anything other than, well, that's, you know, that just can't be. Because they, they've made a very narrow limit on their belief system. And they're not versed in quantum physics. That, that I already know, because I was there. <laughs> and, and until you know that, then you're not operating on scientific principles. So I'll just tell you right now, conventional allopathic medicine is not really scientific in that it does not recognize fully the influence of the uh, invisible energy fields in shaping matter. They do not fully own quantum mechanics as relevant to biology. And this is creating a, a, a big disconnect between real life and the science that they study. Number one, uh, the belief that is taught is that biology and the world we live in operates according to Newtonian principles. 
uh, unfortunate part about that is quantum mechanics 100 years ago said that's obviously not true and physicists know this is not true and yet medicine doesn't buy into it because it still focuses on the material reality and lets go of the invisible shaping fields that quantum physics emphasizes as primary. Okay, so we, got, we have to change that belief system. We have to get people to recognize that the field and the thoughts and all these other things are as important as anything else in shaping the matter we live in. Uh, number two, uh, the belief which I, you know, I blew away years ago, but it's still being taught in school, is the concept that genes control life. This is totally false. Genes control nothing. Control is an action. A gene is a blueprint. It's a physically, literally, a string with blueprint data on it. Why is that relevant? It's interesting. Go to an architect's office, and the architect's working on a blueprint, and then lean over the architect's shoulder and say, is that blueprint on or off? And he looks at you, wait, what's, what, the blueprint's not on or off, it's a blueprint. Yeah, but we talk about genes being on and off, like genes are turn, turning on and genes are turning off. And the question is, but genes are blueprints. They can't turn on and off. There is no on and off. It's just the blueprint. It's a pattern. What we have failed to focus on because we gave genes a character of self-actualization, that my genes decided to do something. It's like, okay, now we're a victim of the genes. But it turns out biologists know that this is not true. Biologists know that genes are not turned on and off. Genes are red or not red, like blueprints. Then all of a sudden it says, well, it's not the blueprint that's important. If the blueprints were self-actualizing, an architect could go by a building site, drop the blueprints off, come back two weeks later, and the building will be there. That's what we think about uh, animals and plants. Uh, the genes are blueprints, and they'll control all this. It's like, no, <laughs> the blueprints are important. I'm not saying they're not. You've got the bad blueprints. You've got some problems going on here. But the issue is it's not the presence or absence of a blueprint, it's whether the blueprint is being read. And then you say, well, then who reads the blueprint? And the answer is, a contractor. And who's the contractor? The mind is the contractor. The mind reads genes. The mind can change the genes readout. Here, here's something so blow away that most people can't, in their conventional world, make sense of it, because it's, it's like, ah, it goes like this. The mind, through what is called epigenetic mechanisms, can start with a single gene blueprint and create over 30,000 different versions of products from the same blueprint. 30,000 different products from the same blueprint. And all of a sudden you realize, my God, the, you can infinitely vary the expression of the gene. And the answer is, yes. And why has this become relevant to all of us? And the answer is, because many of us think genes control our lives, and yet we don't realize that we modify the readout of the genes. So we could be totally healthy, and our mind can cause cancer. Our mind can cause any disease, diabetes, anything like that. And, and what's interesting is the flip side is some people come here with actually defective genes. And guess what? With their mind, they can rewrite those genes and make them normal. So the genes are not the limiting factor. It's the mind. <laughs>